Join Edwin Frondozo on the Business Leadership Podcast every week for a unique program featuring insights and actionable items from the world's most successful business leaders. Hear firsthand the exclusive interviews and personal journeys on how today's transformational leaders made it to the top. We are so in a rush to conquer things, to win, to compete, to make a lot of money, to rise through the ranks. The one thing that I think that gets really lost in that, and I only now have that perspective because I spent so much time trying to think about this, is I wish I enjoyed the journey more. This is the Business Leadership Podcast, and I'm your host, Edwin Frondozo. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. I am really happy to have you. In this episode, I talk with Alfredo Tan, the Chief Digital and Innovation Officer at WestJet Airlines, where he is responsible for building a culture of innovation. Alfredo is also an industry professor and keynote speaker who is very passionate about science and technology. Because of his hunger to learn and constantly improve, he went to Harvard School to do the AMP program earlier this year and is currently pursuing formal education in the legal framework which he doesn't even need at this stage in his career. In this episode, Alfredo explains the different perspectives of what innovation could mean and restate the importance of focusing on what matters. He also shares the challenges he's faced when he started building a culture of innovation. And lastly, Alfredo discuss and lastly, he discusses the importance of having mentors and things that he could have done differently if he was to ask his 20-year-old younger self. Today's episode is brought to you by Slingshot, a Canadian telecommunications leader that provides business VoIP solutions that empower the emerging and innovative organizations that are looking to work with partners that understand what it takes to effectively run a business. Slingshot's business VoIP service ensures that companies are communicating clearly to their customers, team members, and stakeholders. Unlike traditional telcos, their business success advisors understand what it takes to grow and scale a business. To learn more, go to Slingshot VoIP slash TBLP. And with that, here we go. Welcome to the Business Leadership Podcast, Alfredo. Oh, thank you, Edwin. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm super excited and thank you for your time. I know, and we'll get into this, uh, Alfredo. I know you have a pretty full schedule, so to speak. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm excited for to share that. But why don't we get started, um, by introducing who is Alfredo to the listeners out there? Yeah, I guess I, the way I characterize it, I'm just someone who's passionate about science and technology got lucky along the way and have had a sort of fairy tale life um, leading me to this point, both personally and professionally. Oh, wow. I love, I love that description. And um, it's an amazing elevator pitch. So why don't we just jump into today? Um, let's not waste time. Tell us about your current role at WestJet um, and perhaps, you know, what's your responsibilities? What are you, what are you hoping to do? Um, now, or maybe even the in the next 12 to 16 months? Yeah, so um, my current title is Chief Digital and Innovation Officer. And most of the time, people assume the innovation is related to digital. And they're, and they're often not. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, right? So I, I look at my role in two ways. One is, how do I apply digital thinking, digital technology to, and my, my team as a whole to make the guest experience better for the people that travel with us? And then also, at the end of the day, help improve commercial performance. And the innovation piece um, is a different way of doing things, which is sort of, it doesn't involve everything being digital, but how do I get the company and specifically my team at this point to become more innovative, whether that's making things a little bit better or creating net new products or services that we haven't thought about um, at a more sort of disruptive level, right? So often we will assume that innovation is digitally related or technology related because that's sort of what's covered in the press. But I'll give you an example. Sometimes an innovation can be just how you work, right? It's, it's, it's an improvement of how you work, but had nothing to do with a, any cool technology, right? It could also be how you apply 
specific recruiting practices. So the innovation part of my role is a lot of times we tend to focus on technology, but how do we create a culture of innovation by changing sort of the mindset of how we solve problems? Oh, that's amazing. Um, really, I'm, I'm personally, I'm really always interested in that and getting to the human side of innovation. But, you know, one thing in one conversation I always have is, and maybe specific to you, because you talk a lot about building a culture of innovation. Can you share with us, like, What's the most difficult part, maybe in your role or just in general, on how you build a culture of innovation? Yeah, so obviously it's a, it's a topic that everyone speaks about. I'd like to think the angle that I'm able to come at it from is both obviously the theoretical frameworks that you hear about, but I get to, a chance to see it happen in real life, meaning I'm not just talking about it, but I'm winning and losing in the game on a daily basis based on how my um, organization or how my team performs. And the way I think about it is, is, is this, right? So if you think about my job and my title, I have a very senior technology role. 80%, if not 90% of my job has nothing to do with technology. And that's mm -hmm. probably the most fascinating part of the role, right? Everyone assumes that I'm going deep into artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm spending a ton of time on product management or mobile and engineering. All of those functions, for sure, I'm re overall responsible for in my company, but I have people that lead those functions. So the area that I spend a lot of time, obviously, is most leaders is, is sort of strategy and leadership. And if you think about the innovation piece, that's the hardest part to move because it's related to culture and people, right? So if, for example, I, I have this term that I use internally, which is um, the way most tech companies think about it, is focusing on what matters. And that has nothing to do with technology. It, it's simply a guiding principle. One of the guiding principles I get my team to think about. And focusing on matters is, is this. When you hire someone to do great work, what you should be measuring them on is the impact and the output that they were brought on to do. And then maybe a secondary thing you measure on is how they did it. Like the magic of what, how they were able to make that possible. Everything else is largely noise. Edwin, did you work for nine and a half hours today or 10 hours? Was it six or seven? Right. Were your hours from 10 to 9 or 3? To, like all of those things are noise. What are you wearing to the office? Where are you working? So if you think about that, right, just that one dynamic or that one principle changes people's perspectives on how to get work done. You start to focus on what really matters as opposed to focusing on the inputs, which sometimes have really no bearing on what the impact may be. So when I, when I talk about culture of innovation, I, you, you, I start to deconstruct parts of the organization that need to think and move differently from the way they did it in the past. Mm -hmm. And most of the stuff that I talk about in this area or that my team is, that I'm holding my team accountable for the change has nothing to do with the core technology we're working on. Yeah. So, I mean, you talk about focusing on things that matter and you mentioned, let's focus on the things that bring impact and on the role that you brought them in. And when you talk about specific roles and obviously you have, and you mentioned you have experts running these divisions like how does that look like are there tools are there um is it this done manually is it this done like i, I would just want to know how you manage this how you keep those i guess for a lack of better term these kpis of the things that matter yeah so so let's let's take a look at someone that runs product the product organization or engineering right so okay. if you're in the product organization what are you ultimately accountable for you're accountable for delivering a great consumer or guest experience with the digital product you build, the quality and the design, and sort of the um, rallying all the resources to make that come to life, right? So the ultimate measure should be the quality of the product you are producing or the quality of the service you are producing. Everything before that. So let's say it was a team of five people working on it, and they had to build a roadmap they have metrics that they get measured on, on the quality of the product, both qualitative and quantitative metrics. However, do you, and, and I'm going to keep my team accountable for that, but I'm probably not going to call the head of product to say, um, Mr. or Mrs. head of product, how many hours um, did you spend in a day working on that? Yeah. Right. And um, were you wearing a suit and a tie or were you in casual clothing? Did you happen to be sitting in the office on day three or did you happen to be um, sitting somewhere um in, in Mexico, you know, taking a break, but getting work done still. Yes. The, the yeah. thing I'm focused on is the output, not 
um, all the other stuff that we have tended to measure in the past, right? And, and in the past, when we were like in the early industrial revolution where we are on assembly lines, that is what you measured, right? Is all those sort of things that go into an assembly line. Now, I think in a knowledge economy, most of what you're measuring should be the product or the service or the impact you are hired to deliver. All the other stuff, you have to decide what you're measuring if they're the right things to measure. Mm -hmm. So, and, that, and that's interesting. And, and I love how you talk about output. When you came into the organization and you, I guess, let's, let's say you propose this uh, culture and KPIs around impact and output. How long did it take for you to, like, let's say, rally the troops or your teams or your key, your key leaders to really make that change? Because that, that is a shift, right? Especially for folks who've been there for, I, I think you used to say, think people who would celebrate that they've been there for 25 years or 20 years, right? Um, like, how do you get them to change? Yeah, no one really disputes the end goal you're trying to accomplish, right? So for example, let's say your goal is increasing revenue or your goal is driving a better guest experience. No one says, I disagree with you, Edwin, right? Like everyone agrees on these higher aspirations. The challenge is how do you do that? And often um, what some managers will do is managers will dictate the path to getting there. I, I think great leaders and great managers say, here's the goal we need to get to. Let's the leaders of those organizations should should tell me or other leaders how they're going to get there. And then we work through the plan together. Mm -hmm. And often part of that process involves what's the culture we need? What's the working style that we need? How do we collaborate together that helps us get to that goal as well? Often what we do is we just think about the roadmap, but we don't talk about the people element that gets us there. Right. So, and, and that's why I talk about these guiding principles, whether it's, you know, um, having a experimentation mindset, having a sense of urgency mindset, a collaboration mindset, all these elements that are, that we know impact the ability to innovate. That's what, that's what I mean. That starts to come to life and people understand it when they experience it. And if you're asking me for the time frame, it's probably taken about 18 months for the aha moment to happen, right? At mm -hmm. first, you know, the first six months is people just trying to get to trusting you and then another year, trying to see what you're trying to, um, the behaviors you're, you're, you want them to exhibit and you try to show them what that looks like. And then around the 18 month time frame, they see it and then they, they become your disciples of that model and they start talking about it without you having to talk about it anymore because they've seen the, the behaviors that manifest the innovation uh, culture. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I like how you rolled it out within, I guess, a time frame and having it within a year and a half and, and breaking it down. Um, in terms of what happens in the first six months of you coming in as a, as the, you know, the cultural champion, the, the champion of innovation and how long it takes. And, and of course, this is dependent on the size of organization, but WestJet is a pretty big organization. So, you know, you have a lot of people to rally and collaborate and understand what everyone's vision is. And maybe, and I don't know if this happened to you, um, also onboarding some key individuals that may or may not be within the organization at the point when you came in, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe if I can just add three um, three points to that, right, um, Edwin, if that's okay. One of them is I opened up a Toronto office. By doing that, and, and our, our company's Calgary-based, and will always mm -hmm. be Calgary-based, but the magic of opening up another office, we now can recruit people that is outside of the recruiting pool we typically recruited out of. We start to recruit people out of the Toronto market, and we now have a significant of hires coming out of this market. What does that do? It allows an injection of new thinking, new talent into the organization that otherwise wouldn't happen. And diversity of thought is part of innovation, is, is what gives you that innovation culture. So suddenly, it's not just me talking about it. There's a whole bunch of other people who can talk about it from their own experiences. And um, the two examples I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about in terms of the first six months of both one as a challenge and one as a win is in the first three months, I, I managed to um, organize with a lot of collaboration internally our first hackathon. And the hackathon, yes, we were working on a product or uh, guest problem solution that we needed to come up with. But ultimately what that showed people was that if you bring in other thought leaders from other parts of the company, other, par other companies and other industries, could you come up with a solution to a problem in a shorter time frame? And suddenly it opened people's eyes to a different way of working. Even though hackathons aren't sort of new and they're sort of... Um, the, the cool thing to do in most tech companies, there's a ton of value in people seeing what's possible 
in collaborating with different people in a confined time frame. Hey, it, Alfredo, I just yeah. want to ask you and just clarify because I love hackathons and the idea of like startup weekends and, and some lean methodologies, but hackathons for those who are listening and maybe for my benefit, was this, uh, it's happened, you bring together different individuals from your whole organization. They could be customer service champions on, on the ground level. They could be executives. They could be developers. Is, is that something that you did, you put together? Yeah. So we had pilots, we had flight attendants, we had um, guest service agents. So across the company, people had a chance to get to volunteer and get chosen. In addition to that, I managed to bring some of the, you know, best tech companies into our head office from Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, IBM, Deloitte, huge. I think there was 19 technology companies that represented um, the, their, their organizations at, at WestJet. And I paired them with WestJet employees. And in collaboration with the outside organizations, everyone hacked and they competed over an eight to 10 hour period. So um, we gave them a specific problem set, organized them as teams, and we made the teams as diverse as possible from both external and internal participants. And the the output was the output was less important in this case, but it was more a demonstration to show a different way of doing things. And what that gave birth to, and we didn't get my team was not involved in the future ones. We then had a safety hackathon, we had a fuel hackathon, we had a sustainability hackathon, we had a revenue hackathon. I so love start, it. <laughs> so suddenly, and and that's the goal. Yeah. We didn't have to get involved in any of those, nor do we need any credit for it, nor do we need any active participation. It ignited a new way of doing things within the company that my team no longer had a real um, impact on because we were trying to create a different way of doing things. So that's an example where that role has nothing. My, if you think about my digital role, the mm -hmm. hackathons had nothing to do with it. No, that's amazing, and that was a that that was a quick win, I guess, when you first came on. That was within your first three months, you said, right? Yeah, first ninety days. Um, you know, it was uh, it was great coverage internally and externally. Uh, so it was a good quick win just to show people that innovation culture or culture of innovation isn't dependent on technology, despite the fact that it starts usually from a tech company perspective, but it showed people that it doesn't involve technologists all or engineers all the time. A moment from our sponsor. As leaders, we enter a new year and decade with new goals. But do you have a clear vision of where and how to grow your business, how does your workforce look like? As we prepare for the growing gig economy and remote workforce, it is important to understand that you are working with communications partners that can help you get there. Slingshot understands the growing needs of business leaders and works with them to ensure their infrastructure is aligned to their vision and growth plans of their leaders. To learn more, go to slingshotvoip.com slash tblp for those who are listening and looking to i guess introduce a, some sort of culture of innovation it sounds like uh from what alfredo is saying it just hosting one hackathon could just move the tide if you did one thing it sounds like do a hackathon <laughs> well you know I, I wouldn't i wouldn't go there that quickly i'd win you yeah. know it was, this one was maybe a combination of luck and timing but right. let me give you another example of something i did in the first 90 days that wasn't immediately successful okay um so working from home or remote working is accepted in most companies but not all and mm -hmm. and frankly at westjet it really wasn't one of those um it, it, principles that was embraced but i wanted to sort of change that so not only did I think the ability to work from home, depending on the situation, should be something we should adopt, I wanted to take it to the next level. And so I came up with a concept called Work From Maui. And as a West End employee, one, and most airlines, one of the benefits of working for an airline is the ability for you to be able to uh, travel pretty much all over the world for a relatively low cost. Mm -hmm. So what I said was, you know, we have some talented people and maybe as a recruiting strategy as well, if someone like Edwin's on my team and he's a high performer and he decides he's going to go to Maui with his family for a week, but if he's already there, he's, he's done the time and he's traveled all the way there, maybe he wants to spend a week working from Maui as opposed to working from home or from the office. Right. Yeah. Why can't he do that? So I said, we should. So we piloted a program where anyone on my team was a high performer once a quarter, in addition to the regular vacation, they can tack on a week or week and a half and count that as work 
but it doesn't count as vacation. They just have to be accessible as if they were um, remote working from their home office. Mm -hmm. And you would think the adoption of that would have been pretty aggressive, right? I would think so. But I mean, this is me knowing who I am. <laughs> no one did in the first six months. I, I had to ask someone, hey, I'm really confused. Why, why is no one working, quote unquote, from Maui? Isn't this like a great program? And someone came up to me and said, I'm not sure anyone believes you. And then I realized that maybe I'd swung the pendulum too strong because that sort of freedom and flexibility was so foreign that something like working for Maui scared some people from doing it. So I then had some of more of the senior leaders on the team saying, I need you to demonstrate that this is real and that it can still drive impact in the organization. So now it's becoming a more common thing and people are actually taking advantage of it in a way they didn't before. But an example of sometimes you, you have to be careful how you move the culture not so aggressively because some people won't adopt it right away because I hadn't built enough trust yet that they didn't even believe it was something that was real. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you mentioned at the top, you know, you had this dream career. You worked for a number of global grand, uh, brands, including um, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Can you, Alfredo, maybe share with us a difficult decision? It could be earlier on in your career, it could be mid career, something that you, know, you had a real hard time making at the time. Um, but it, it really allowed you to grow as a business leader. Yeah, that's a great question, Edwin. I, I um, When I open up by saying I have a fairy tale professional and personal life, it's because I feel like the decisions I've made have played out the right way, even though at the time I really had no confidence in the decision I was making, mm -hmm. which is maybe my attempt to tell you that I'm being really vulnerable here to say that I wish I could tell you I masterminded the process. <laughs> yeah. But, but man, I, I just think I'm really lucky. And, and my biggest fear is that one day my luck's going to run out in terms of the decision I make. So let me give you the two stories. Um, or, 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 actually, I'll tell you the one story, but it's, it's, it, it dovetails into, it will seem like two stories. When I was at uh, Simpatico MSN, I was having a great time working there. And uh, I had a great leadership team. I enjoyed myself. I was learning a lot of stuff. I got a call about 16 months into the job for a position at Yahoo in Silicon Valley. And, you know, obviously in technology, you, you aspire to one day work in the Valley. But this job was unique because it would allow me to work both in the Valley as well as um, being in Canada. So I'd be able to travel between two great cities, San Francisco and Toronto. Mm -hmm. I end up um, taking the job despite all the advice not to take it. Because I hadn't been at Sabbatical MSN long enough. Yahoo was a questionable company as it was going to battle with Google. So the history of what Yahoo could become in the future was still in question. And I ended up choosing the role despite all the, the hesitation I had around it. Because I can't explain. It just felt like the right thing to do. And to get to do something that you'd always imagined you'd get a chance to do. Regardless if the role didn't sound too perfect. In addition, the, the executive recruiter, I'll never forget this. I asked him... He asked me what the probability of executives in Silicon Valley coming to recruit Canadian talent and how often that happens. I naively said, yeah, how often does that happen? He mm -hmm. says, it hardly happens. Take the job. So I ended up taking the job and it was everything and more. It, it, it fulfilled everything I thought it was going to be. 18 months later, I get a call from Facebook. Oh, actually, let me, let me rewind. Before I, uh, I took the job at Yahoo!, the day that I resigned from Simpatico MSN, and I literally had just signed my paperwork for Yahoo. I can't make this up, Edwin. Google called. No way. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> well, I, was, I was in my, my small condo on Richmond and Spadina. I pick up the phone and it's Google asking me to come in for interviews in New York and Mountain View. And I just literally signed my Yahoo paperwork. And um, I had said to this, the, the recruiter at Google saying, hey, you know, I'm... I've already accepted my role. I'm ready to go on vacation in the next two days before I start my role. I'm really sorry. Um, I, 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 you know, you're Google. I would love an opportunity to speak to you, but I've already sort of made up my mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and Google is a brilliant recruiting machine. They said, listen, what can we do to convince you? We'll, we'll fly you from your vacation to the interviews in, in the U.S. and then fly you back on vacation just to see if this would be of something of interest to you. And who wouldn't be compelled by that? It was just hugely compelling. And they were just so considerate and courteous, I, I said, let me get back to you on that. 
And then I remember my conversation with my mentor at the time, and she was saying to me, do you want your first job in the Valley to be somewhat um, tainted by you signing a contract and then backing out on it because you got a potentially better opportunity? Right. And she said, and can you live with that knowing that that, you know, you didn't even get a chance to try out the job that you had just spent months working on with another partner. And she was right. And, you know, that's the power of mentors. It gives you a perspective that sometimes you're not, you're blinded by the situation. Right. And I respectfully declined the Google interview process, right? So I'm not here telling you that they offered me a job. It was just declining the interview process. Okay. And, and they were unbelievable, by the way. They, just to give you a sense for how much I love that company, they ended up saying, the, the recruiter said, you know, um, we're sorry, it's our loss. We didn't get to you sooner. And I just thought that was just incredibly professional. Mm -hmm. But here's why I share that story. 18 months after I started Yahoo!, I get a call from Facebook and the recruiting process starts at Facebook. If I had gone to Google, given Google's market dominance at the time and its growing market dominance, I'm not sure going leaving Google to go to Facebook would have been an easy decision because leaving Yahoo to go to Facebook was already a challenge. So if I had gone back on my Yahoo offer and chose Google, Maybe my career path would have taken a different trajectory because I wouldn't have ended up at Facebook because I couldn't imagine leaving Google after only 18 months to join a startup at the time, which had no real understanding of what it would become when it got older. Well, I mean, that, that's a fascinating story. And there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of lessons um, there um, to be had for anyone listening. And especially when you're dealing with multiple offers and understanding you know, what's presented at you and, and how you manage your relationships, whether they're people you just met or not. But I really appreciate you sharing that. It's definitely, you can't make that one up. Um, so I wanted to just ask you real quickly, Alfredo, and what's really fascinating when I talk to my guests, uh, business leaders, is, you know, what they do to continually grow, to retool, to up level. And for you, which is amazing. I mean, other than going to law school, <laughs> like what are some of the other things that you do to ensure that you're continually to grow, to be more of an effective business leader, executive as, as, as you head on and grow in your career? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Edwin. I, I, um, I, I think the thing that I'm focused on, and maybe it's just a result of my background and my upbringing is I never take for granted I'm going to have the opportunities I have on an ongoing basis. Meaning there's a sort of built-in paranoia that if I'm not getting better, then I may not have the opportunities that I have. So the way I think about it is this. I, I think with a sense of urgency that I may not have a job in 18 months. I pretend that every job I get, I have to re-earn it for the next 18 months, right? Most times you, you enter a role and you assume, well, I'm going to be in this company for 5, 20 years. If you have a mentality that tells, that makes you feel like you have a job or you're going to be at a company for that time period, what's the panic to do anything, right? Because if you're going to be somewhere for 10 years, then you move at a certain pace. But if you only have 18 months, you become a sponge for wanting to learn as much as you can. You become obsessed with um, being curious and just getting better and better. And you never get complacent, right? And I think the thing that I'm attracted to, no matter what I do, is just the continual pursuit of more and more knowledge. So whether it was um, going to Harvard Business School to do the AMP program earlier this year to become a, mm -hmm. a better leader, whether it's now pursuing um, formal education in the in the legal framework to get my master's of law in innovation, law and technology, which you can argue I don't really need in my job or at this stage in my career. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just hungry to learn and right. constantly improve. And in today's world, that's almost everything, right? Like the, the DNA to be a learning organism is probably a, a huge advantage if you, if you have that desire to do that. It doesn't have to be formal. It could be informal, whether it's in the job, attending workshops. But, you know, if I could give anyone advice is never stop the desire for accumulation of knowledge and the application of it. Uh, yeah, exactly. And even from the most part, always, always reading and just learning and listening. I think it's, I think it's huge, um, to always continually and to have that desire and that muscle to learn. Um, so thank you for sharing that and congrats on going back to do a post grad, whether you need it or not. It just shows that you have that hunger, 
um, and that curiosity to learn and, and upskill yourself. Alfredo, can you maybe name a person who's had a tremendous impact on you as a business leader? It could be a mentor, um, a boss, or someone in your past that, uh, that really helped you and push you forward. Yeah, there's two. I, I can't narrow it down to, to one. Mm-hmm. I've had so many terrific ones. But if I had to pick two, there's a gentleman by the name of Tim Hewitt who I worked with at Bell Canada. He was incredible in the early stages of my career, and I still keep in touch with him on a regular basis and has been a tremendous mentor to me both personally and professionally. And then as of late, Jordan Banks, who's the current president of Rogers Media, and he was someone I worked very closely with as my, as my manager and leader at Facebook. And uh, he was he's been equally incredible in helping uh, transform my life both personally and professionally as well. And the, the two of them, w- whenever I think about leadership and the decisions I make, I often draw um, some questions in my head, which is what would either of them tell me what to do or how they would handle it? Because they are um, exceptional human beings and exceptional leaders that I still continue to learn from today. Yeah, and that that exercise about what would they do, this is just you knowing who they are. This is not you actually talking to them. These are like your your advisory figures that maybe help you real quickly as well, right? I mean, that that's an exercise. Yeah, it's an, you know, I don't, I, I would love to be able to pick up the phone on a regular basis, but obviously respectful of their time and <laughs> obviously wanting to grow on my own in certain areas. But yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, I worked for, I spent a lot of time with Jordan for almost a decade, so. There's a ton of learnings there. And um, often because he has been so fantastic in his leadership, I often use it as a reference point to just to think about and check any decision I'm making um, if I'm unsure of uh, which way to go. But yes, I uh, I think about it out loud and in my head um, at the same time, but it's not a, it's not an actual phone call to them. Like, by the way, they're, they're tremendous that they would absolutely take the call. Um, but uh, I, I do my best to, to not disturb them on all the issues I'm dealing with. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Do you have, um, I guess, outside? I mean, you you have quite of a full agenda, full full workload. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any special project initiatives. It could be a personal, professional, anything fun that that uh, you're looking forward to, excited about it, and maybe you want to share with us. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty boring person, Edwin. So <laughs> you know, outside of the professional endeavors, I I um, just pretty much staying like staying at home with my animals and my rescue animals and my family and my friends and my partner um, for the most part. So, you know, I just liked spending the downtime just because my professional life is so on the go. I mean, in addition to the, um, to the job at WestJet, I do part-time lectures as a industry professor at McMaster university. I give um, a few keynotes um, throughout the quarter at different industry events and corporate offsites to talk about, uh, cultures of innovation and digital transformation. So much of my extracurricular activities also centers around my, the passion of what I do on a day to day basis. So when it comes down a uh, time to sort of decompress, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, you know, having great food with great family and friends, spending time with again, you know, the, the people that I love the most, my, my, you know, amazing rescue animals and going on vacations wherever I can. Yeah, work from Maui, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to be trying that sometime soon. But yes, I have not taken advantage of the very thing I tried to implement. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Alfredo, I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts, observations, ideally actionable recommendations that you can share with the listeners today who are looking to grow in their careers and maybe looking to take on their first management role. Yeah, maybe I'll take it a little more broader than that. If I, you know, you know, Edwin, if I could just talk about what I would give myself advice. Yeah, I, was, I like know, that. Yeah, you know, obviously I'll address the managerial one, but here's the way I would think about it is we are so in a rush to conquer things, to win, to compete, to make a lot of money, to rise through the ranks. The one thing that I think that gets really lost in that, and I only now have that perspective because I spent so much time trying to think about this is, I wish I enjoyed the journey more, whether Mm. it was becoming my first, you know, manager and, you know, taking my first management role and then trying to do that great. And then moving into more senior level roles, we never stop to enjoy the present and just celebrate the wins in the moment. Cause once you've done that, you, you look for the next thing. And then you realize 20 or 25 years later in your career, you ask yourself, what was really the rush? And, you know, it's the advice I give to my sister who's also ambitious and, and rising through her career, which is just take your time because 
whether it happens at 38 or 43, does it really matter? But it does matter to a certain extent because you didn't enjoy it while you were rushing to try to get through it. So if there was one piece of advice, it, it would be just to find a way to slow it down and enjoy the road to wherever it is you're trying to get to because the career really has no destination, right? And that's sort of the myth because you have these sort of, I need to be a VP by this date. I want to make it to the C-suite by this date. And then you ask yourself, kind of why, right? Like what's the real reason you created that timeline versus I'm going to do the best I can in the current role that I have. I'm going to learn as much as I can, acquire all this knowledge, do great work and enjoy the whole process while it's happening. That's amazing. Amazing insight and advice for sure. What is the rush? <laughs> Alfredo, to close, um, can you tell us where we can find more information about you, WestJet, I guess your your keynote speaks or anything else that uh, you'd like to share with us today? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not as active as I should be on like the social media channels, but I'm, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook as well. So I'm on all the channels. And um, I, most of my keynotes, usually the, uh, they're, they're not really any specific location where they're being broadcast, but maybe I can send some to you when they're on, when I have them scheduled and you can share them to your audience. Oh, I would. And I'd love that as well. Alfredo, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to join us on the Business Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much for your time as well, Edwin. That's it, biz leaders. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Business Leadership Podcast. This was number 142 with Alfredo Tan. If you want to learn more about Alfredo, WestJet Airlines, or anything else that we discussed, please go to thebusinessleadership.com slash 142. Please do join me on my private Facebook group where I will discuss this episode, answer your questions, and connect you with other like-minded business leaders. Simply search for the Business Leadership Group directly in Facebook. Thank you again to our sponsor, Slingshot, a Canadian telecommunications leader in business VoIP communications, a company that understands strategic growth, which aligns with your vision and goals of the future. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe, rate, and leave a comment on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening today. Thank you again. Edmund signing off. Thank you for listening to the Business Leadership Podcast at thebusinessleadership.com. Help me.